Um, now, many thanks for coming down. This was all very last minute because Richard kindly um, offered to give a talk more about his architecture. Um, today he was at the university talking about his research and publication work around Scarpa. And um, we managed to record it. James, um, at the last minute, came down and recorded it. So we will get this uploaded onto our website at some point. And for anyone who missed it, it was an incredible hour and a half. I know some people here today uh, witnessed the, the lecture. A lot of people will know that Richard um, has produced quite a substantial book on Carlos Scarpa, in particular Castle Vecchio. Um, Richard embarked on a research project when he was a, um, a lecturer at Edinburgh University from 1984 um, through to 89. And in that period, he um, got the luxury of going over and looking through Scarpa's archives. And incredibly, there wasn't that much at that point in time explored about Scarpa. The thing that's really interesting about the talk today is that it opens up the world of Scarpa as a museum designer and in many ways a curator. I mean, I've certainly read a lot of Richard's written material. I've heard lectures about Scarpa before. Today was another world to me, uh, an insight into, into work that I'd never heard about, particularly to do with the way Scarpa constructs space and um, curates the visitor experience. It's really timely for us to have Richard here in the house, in the Boyd house. We've had 23 students, Philip Gordon and I, working all semester on a strange portfolio of projects by Boyd. Um, and it's called the House of Ideas. So I think it was appropriate, which is a Boyd term. It was an article he wrote for the Sunshine House back in 1951. Um, and um, we've adopted that title, House of Ideas. So again, it was a really lovely opportunity to get Richard to come in and kind of under that umbrella of the House of Ideas. After the lecture, please take time to wander about. I know some people here have already been through the exhibition. Um, <coughs> A lot of people probably thought at the beginning of the semester, what are you going to do with Boyd that we've not heard before? Um, um, interestingly, there's a lot of undiscovered material in the house. Um, Philip Goad and Tony Lee, who are both um, proclaimed experts in Boyd, have um, agreed that there's a lot of information in here that they didn't know about that we've uncovered, or the students have helped to uncover. Just to explain it briefly, the front of the house is all about um, Boyd's exhibition work, his curatorial work, his work in television and um, on radio. He has scripted incredible TV series which were never made, unfortunately, where he critiques Australian identity and culture. And at the same time, he's writing that material. He's celebrating Australia through the expos of 67 and 70. The talking chair from Night Expo 70 is upstairs, the original prototype. Hence, it's the brown leatherette that Mary Featherston last Saturday said she hated it. Um, it wasn't intended to be that, that material. But that's one of the original prototypes that we've got back in the house. We have an original cutlery set in the kitchen, which was in a drawer in here, amazingly, which was a prototype for 1967. And it's, we're looking to get it remade. In the back pavilion, in the children's area, we're celebrating a lot of his work around show homes and display homes, Sunshine House, House of Tomorrow, um, and Steg Bar Windows. One of the students has produced a whole catalogue of Steg Bar Windows. Um, and an apple tree estate as well is in the back bedroom. There's also work um, over in the corner there to do the Natural History Museum, the circular building. And one of the things about that that's really fascinating is if you find some of Boyd's writing about that building, where he talks about geometry, you'll find this idea of the circle motif in every one of his exhibition displays and, um, and expo work, which is, again, something unusual. It's come out of all of this work. So what we're saying is that we know a lot about Boyd's writing and his publication work and a lot of his houses and domestic architecture. This is a whole portfolio of projects that have been kind of underexplored. And we've been trying to tease a lot of this out as we work towards 2019 and 100 years of Boyd. So Tony and a lot of the volunteers of the foundation have been working towards a big monograph in 2019, and we're really hopeful that we can turn this into a bigger retrospective of his work. Now, to turn my attention to Richard, um, <laughs> um, I, I talked a lot today about <laughs> Richard's work with Scarpa, um, but tonight we're going to hear a bit more about his architecture. And I think the important message in that is a lot of people, because Richard was writing about Scarpa before he launched his practice in 91, often associate a lot of his work with Scarpa. And I think you'll all learn tonight that it's so much more complicated and complex and richer in terms of the layering of influence, influences in his work. You'll find Frank Lloyd Wright, I'm sure, in there somewhere. Yes? 
um, and many others. So um, I did say today that as a young graduate, I ended up leaving the UK and going to Berlin um, in 1990. There was no work um, for, for young architects at that point in time. Um, I had to get some practical experience for my logbooks. Thought I was there for six months and stayed three years. But while I was in Berlin in 1991, a friend um, sent me over an AJ with one of Richard's um, small house extensions. And I, I can't stress how much that changed the culture of what was going on in Scotland at that point in time. Um, we, have had a we had a tradition up to then of a lot of gr our strongest graduates disappearing to London for their last year of their degree, thinking that's where all the work, the interest in work was. And I know I can say confidently, as I was one of those young practitioners who came back to Scotland in 93, there was a newfound confidence. And I do credit a lot of that to what Richard was doing back then, not just as a pr practicing architect, but also as an educator and a, and a critic and a very powerful critic. So he's an important voice in the context of Scottish architecture um, and probably not given enough credit for that, I think, in terms of the lack of commissions that come out of Scotland. Um, He's one of the few that's built outside of the UK um, in terms of Scottish practitioners in Sri Lanka, Colombo in Sri Lanka for the, the British <laughs> Embassy. Uh, a fantastic building I got to, got to visit three years ago. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you will know from television that his house, his own house in Edinburgh, won um, House of the Year in 2016 with Channel 4 and the RIBA. And that was one of the things I was quite keen to hear about tonight, having not been over here for five years, I've not had the chance to see it or visit it. So I will we'll hand over to Richard. And thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, uh, two things before I start. First of all, I, I picked up something in Malaysia. Uh, so I've been struggling all day, so if I sort of collapse into a fit of coughing or something, I'm not going to die, honest, but uh, you'll have to forgive me. Um, and secondly, there are two books actually wandering around the audience. There's one at the front here about our own work, and then there's a piece of shameless publicity for a book, the, the, the recent Carlos Scarpa and the Castle Vecchio Revisited, which came out literally yesterday, and we're pub I'm publishing it myself. so. That's somewhere around. Please don't walk off with it because it's my only copy uh, to take to uh, Brisbane and New Zealand. So, okay, um, right. Well, um, the book that is there, which we produced about five years ago. I mean, it's a piece of what's known as vanity publishing in this in the trade. Um, is titled "Architecture of Its Own Time and Place." Everyone hear me, by the way. Right. Okay, I'll speak up. Um, the book's called Of Its Time and Of Its Place, and um, Architecture of Its Time and Place. And that you'd say that's an obvious truism, isn't it, really? But it's not. Um, we started life in an incredibly conservative city called Edinburgh, where people wish the 20th century had never happened. And architects are seen as a minor branch of the criminal classes who have wrecked everything, basically. So we don't have a very good press. And um, th there is a sort of un feeling that just go away, and because we don't want any 20th century architecture. And I have to keep pointing out to people what William Morris talked about, which was that all continuity of history is perpetual change. And we're always changing. And if you look back at history, our architecture, our artifacts have always reflected the society at the time, that it's technology, it's way of doing things and what have you. And why that shouldn't happen now is a mystery to me. So I'm always arguing from a sort of philosophical point of view, even in the heart of a historic city centre or a conservation area, that we need to make architecture of the 20th and 21st century, if only that our grandchildren should have some history. And I feel that quite passionately. So um, we're often under pressure not to do that or to we, or to do what we call in the office stealth projects where they pretend they're not there. And I, I don't know if you have the same problems in Melbourne, I suspect not, or not to the same extent, but Edinburgh is a very tough town uh, in that sense. And then architecture of its place is also sounds obvious, doesn't it? But it's not really, in the sense that, you know, up till about the um, 19th century, um, we could see very clearly that architecture was kind of rooted to the place it's in and the materials and the way of doing things. 
And what was even more interesting is that it, it seemed to be incredibly beautiful and also seemed to te deal with microclimates and what have you incredibly cleverly with limited means. And something went wrong in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution. Then that got much worse with the 20th century with the, uh, the motor car and globalization. So now our cities are quite ugly, basically. I think you'd all agree with me. Um, and no disrespect to Melbourne, but I mean, it's no, it's no different from anywhere else in that respect. Boy, Kuala Lumpur is really ugly, actually. Um, but uh, so we've lost something. There's, there's something broken. And I, this is one of my favorite books when I was a student and written in the 60s. And obviously a bit humbling for architects, the idea that you can have architecture without architects. But it's a whole series of just beautiful black and white photographs. I'm sure many people are familiar with it, showing how thousands and thousands of people with limited means respond to microclimate <coughs> and make architecture in all sorts of parts of the world, which is both elegant and um, sparse with its resources, but also incredibly beautiful. And it's the sort of place that we now get on Ryanair or EasyJet to go and have our holidays in because uh, it's just naturally beautiful. So I'm always interested in how we can make architecture that is kind of rooted because of globalization, you know, it's very difficult really, how you can make architecture that's rooted to the place it's in without, of course, falling into the terrible trap which a planner might do, which is basically say, make it look vaguely like the building next door, which is uh, the worst possible uh, thing you could do. Incidentally, I think it's quite interesting when you go to favelas in South America, actually, where there's a sort of a contemporary, um, uh, no architects there, and hundreds of people making things from limited means. It actually has, uh, I think, uh, an incredible beauty as well, actually. So it's not dead yet. So um, I'm not Scottish. Um, in fact, if anybody wants a translation of what Alan says, uh, ask me, because I can <laughs> act as a translator. Uh, but I've been up there on, for 40 years. But um, what fascinates me about Scotland, in a way, is two things. Well, it's one thing, it's the lights, really. We have to put up with all these depressions coming off the Atlantic all the time. And the way the light just constantly changes every, every hour sometimes, or every minute, it's quite beautiful. But also, you have to remember, in a place like Melbourne, we're a long way north. We're the equivalent of the very tip of South America. I think your Bordeaux, Jamie was saying last night. We're a long, long way north. And that means we get six hours light on December the 21st. But we get, it doesn't go dark until about half past 11 at night on June the 21st. And I find that produces a totally different sort of mentality in people. It's also a, a thick-walled country, you know. Um, unlike, say, bits of England, which aren't just like that. And uh, when Luke Hahn came to Edinburgh, they took him to Borthwick Castle, and he realized that he hadn't actually invented the idea of served and servant spaces. It's all there anyway. But I like the idea of thick walls that you can then, when you're extending or altering, you can contrast it with a sort of planar tectonic architecture. And the modern movement has done very well with, modern, with summertime architecture. Aldo van Eyck said that, uh, the Dutch architect and writer said that a house should be both a bird's nest and a cave. In other words, an extrovert place like this in the summertime, but also a place where you need to retreat in the wintertime. I, I suspect there isn't much wintertime here, but, but there certainly is in Scotland. And um, I think we've done rather well on summertime architecture. I once got into trouble in the AJ RIBA journal for saying, what's it like to have flu in the Farnsworth house? You know, you don't want to be expansive to the landscape. Um, in fact, uh, when I used to teach, I used to teach first years, and in week one of first year, I used to put two squares on the blackboard. One was totally covered black with a tiny little white line in it, and the other one was totally white with a black line and little clusters of dots in a tartan pattern. And I used to get the students to guess what the buildings were, because I said, that is the history of architecture. It's 5,000 years of architecture between one and the other. And of course, you probably already got it. And one is the pyramids in Egypt, which is all poche. It's all black stuff on the plan. And the other is Norman Foster's Stansted Airport, which just happens to be the same floor area. And, and you could say that all the way through architecture, if you look at the plans, it's the black bits that have been gradually disappearing. Yep. So the Romanesque turned into the Gothic, which turned into the steel frame Victorian, which turned into the modern. And now, you know, if you go to Norman Foster or something, his main objective is to make everything out of glass, it seems to me. That's probably not fair, but you know what I mean. So um, I think uh, that's unfortunate because 
I think we need to have the alternative psyche, and I think, I think Le Corbusier understood that uh, with the Maison Jao, um, but also our local hero of Macintosh, when he was making the library, which is currently being rebuilt after the fire, uh, which is here. And the, the light absolutely fights to get in through the windows and the thick walls. So in the middle of summer, electric lights are always on in that building, and you think that's strange. But I think Macintosh thought that the psychology of study is a sort of evening, wintertime thing, not a summertime thing. And even in the marriage bed in Hill Head, it's almost like you're in a white womb with a tiny pinprick of light. I think he understood completely that idea of retreating into something very cosy and, and what have you. And then only what? 20 years later with the Bauhaus and what have you, everything became glass. Well, uh, I'm going to make a couple of jokes and then, um, which I didn't make this lunchtime. Uh, <laughs> Peter Smithson said to his uh, students, apparently, <coughs> at the AA, that they'd be very, very lucky if they had an original idea in their entire life. So that's quite interesting, actually, because I think there is a cult of excessive invention and creativity, which may sound like a strange thing to say, but I think architects in history have always looked to other architects and sort of copied them, or not copied them, but they've sort of emerged from them. There isn't a sort of revolutionary idea that you start with a white sheet of paper and no influences anywhere. So I, I do believe that very profoundly. So we haven't, I haven't had an idea at all yet, so... Um, and what was the other joke? Oh yes, Herzog de Meuron. I'm a bit worried if you're recording this, aren't you? I'd be careful actually. But <laughs> there's, uh, they did a documentary film, and uh, they said in their usual humorous Swiss way, they said um, every building of ours is completely different from the last one. And I thought that's amazing because they're either geniuses or schizophrenics because every building I do is exactly the same as the last one. And I don't have a problem if I'm still interested in the same thing. So I wanted to show you three very quick single rooms, as Alan mentioned, little tiny jobs that we started our life with very quickly. So a very typical problem of sorting out the back of an Edwardian house, because Edwardian families had maids and things, and now people want to live in the kitchen and enjoy the back garden. So uh, we think of um, a, a building as ruining it. In fact, some journalist once said, I went around Edinburgh ruining people's houses. And so you think of taking a, making a ruin of the stonework, which is two feet thick, and then putting on an alien um, uh, structure, and then some sliding windows, and then a big roof, and some roof lights to bring light in. And then you end up with this. So basically, what I'm interested in, I don't like isms in architecture. I think, I think architecture is too serious a business to be part of the fashion business. And I, I feel that quite profoundly, actually. I, it worries me hugely when you have star architects who are all, this, all this, this decade's fashion, and then the next decade, they're all out. That can't be right. You have to do things which I think are more prolonged, really. And what interests me about architecture is to try and express or overexpress how you make a building. So, for, for instance, here, this is just this idea of stick on stick is ch stolen from the English architect, Edward Cullinan, who stole it from Green and Green, who got it from the Japanese, who got it probably from the Chinese. And, uh, like that, and the idea of the disappearing corner probably comes from Rietveld, who got it from Frank Lloyd Wright, who did have an original idea about the destruction of the box. So it's a little tiny room that transforms itself, that I'm rather, which I rather enjoy. It's <coughs> Opus One, if you like. And then here's the, is exactly the same project on a different house, where that is semi-ruined, and then a building um, springs off the stonework. And we enjoy crafting the steel, if you like, and sorry about me, but um, so it's the separation of the structure and the enclosing elements and things that slide and disappear in corners and all that kind of stuff. So there you go. So those are fun little things that we did at the beginning. And here's the third one. And certainly I'm popping in the odd rogue slide just to keep you awake. Um, that's the Sir John Soane Museum, of course, which is, Alan rightly said, I am actually interested in a lot of other architects apart from Scarpa. It's a bit annoying. Paul Finch of the Architects Journal once called me Scarpa Flow, which really really was quite cruel, actually. And uh, anyhow, hidden sources of light. So here's the third one, and there it is again with um, you know, structure and enclosure pulled apart. And, but basically still four walls on a roof, uh, like that. And we could fiddle around at the back of people's houses because the planners would let us do that, certainly not at the front. And then an interesting way how they open. And then in, this was a, a progression to the wintertime idea 
there's a ship's winch handle there, there, and this all closes down, the ceiling closes down, and everything <laughs> moves, so it does become that idea of the, um, uh, the cave, if you like. Okay, well, we met this guy today, and the reason I'm showing you that again is the idea of relining an original facade, putting a new facade behind the openings of the original facade, which I've used shamelessly on a number of projects. And here, uh, incidentally, that's the Maison de Verre, which is one of, the, one of my pin-up buildings. Why? Because it's total unity of, a bit like here, actually, of furniture and architecture. And um, also, it has a fantastic transformability as opposed to flexibility, which I'm interested in. Anyway, this is a muse for horses and stables, which has been altered in the 60s. But these days, planners, they're all turned into houses, of course. In the new, you, I'm sure if I, if I mention the new town of Edinburgh, you all know what I mean, don't you? Yes, OK. Um, so uh, it's, uh, I mean, you're expected to produce a sort of ersatz Georgian cottage, basically, with sash and case windows and whatnot. But I, I thought that was a terrible abrogation of the need to explain and clarify the history of the building. So, I'm sorry, I'm not very good at drawing horses, but that's 1820, <laughs> and that's where the hay was, and there would have been a stable boy who had a short and brutal life living there, but it never was, it never was a house. Uh, so, this is the new one here, we had to have a garage. So, really, I suppose what it's about is bringing light in in a very radical way, but also seeing the transformation of the facade. So, there you go. Uh, so, then you can see the new architecture inside the original building and the new floor level established here and a sort of planar overlapping architecture with tricks. So that looks like a constant big lead panel but in fact that's a shadow gap and that's mirrors and things like that. Uh, and then inside it's kind of fun with, uh, I, I love mirrors from Sir John Soane's house, so that's a mirror so it looks like you own the house next door. My dad came round once actually, my dad was a bit of a tough North of England guy, he wouldn't, you know, he's one of these guys from the North of England, you couldn't get ever any praise out of him for anything actually quick to criticise and slow to praise. And he was standing there, I could see him getting really hot under the collar, and he says, well, when are we going to go into that room? I said, Dad, keep your voice down, that's the neighbours. <laughs> I've had him fooled completely. So there we go, a fun project about eight by five metres where you can get to design all the furniture as well. And then exactly the same project again for the world's first Maggie Centre in Edinburgh, uh, where we put a building inside a building in the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And that's a tiny project where every inch of the building is used and I had no idea of course when we were doing this one in fact they had their um, 20th 21st birthday the other day which was quite scary and uh, that it would take off and it's now a global phenomenon actually anyhow um, that is also interesting because when you do a, a building inside a building it's then dead easy and they came along to ask us to extend it five years later which we weren't expecting and so we just pulled the building out with the architectural forceps and, and that's the new bit, and that's the new bit there. So, and it becomes, I tell students, because it's frustrating being a student, because you don't get to build your buildings, and you don't generally get to detail them much either, because it's all a bit dry, isn't it? Uh, but I always tell them that, you know, how you put a building together is the moment that gets its sex appeal, or not, in the case may be. And so I'm quite interested in how we overlap materials and, and do various things. We have a fetish about disappearing corners, in case you hadn't spotted that a little place to sit. I'm, I'm very interested in people, basically, in uh, psychology, and obviously in a place like this where you've just been diagnosed with cancer, to give places to people to sit, to be on their own, and always want to be part of a group, hidden sources of light and what have you, a view to a room so there's no, no closed doors and what have you, people know what's going on. <laughs> well, now for something completely different, as they say. Here we are on the west coast of Ireland. I'm going to show you um, two or three houses, and in the countryside. I'm finishing with my house, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, this is, is anyone here from Ireland? Okay, well, I can be rude. Um, <laughs> the Irish have wrecked Ireland completely. And if you've been there, uh, the west coast of Ireland is just scattered with hideous bungalows, basically. You could buy a book for 10 pounds called Bungalow Bliss, and all the plans are there. And for a long time, I worked as a student in Galway, and planning permission was a plan, that was it. You didn't have anything else, it was incredible. So the landscape has kind of been littered with these things. And this is a sort of traditional um, building. And it's quite interesting when you look at it. It's mostly roof, not much wall. It's not a building in the round, it's a space formed by it and its spire. Um, it's in a hollow against the wind. 
And this is a very modest example of what I might have shown you that's going on. The site is cleared, it's put on the highest bit of the ground. Because you use truss rafters for the roof, it's mostly wall and not much roof. Uh, so it's almost like the gopher misere of the original. So we have the project of what to do. You can't do this, obviously, you wouldn't want to do that. But how do you make an architecture which is rooted to the landscape of the west of Ireland? Well, there's a lot of this stuff here, dry stone walling, which farmers still do. And there's also a lot of this stuff as well, corrugated iron. So this was our building, a simple form with a big space in the middle and rooms at either end. And then we stole Ted Cullinan's detailing at Fountains Abbey Visitor Centre in Yorkshire. And that's the building that we built. So it's a corrugated aluminium roof. But the important bit is that the stone appears to be a continuity with all the stonework of the fields and whatnot. So you can't, you can't spot the join, as it were. Happy clients, two disappearing corners, and uh, quite a lot of fun place to, to build, of course. And uh, so, you know, where, where is the join? You can't see it at all. And um, I like that. Sometimes a, a client has a good idea, which is kind of annoying, actually, because you're supposed to want to have some. And this guy, who's, who's English, but I think he's gone native, he, uh, he wanted to sit in the bath and talk to people in the rest of the house. So that's a bath tap, and there's a panel that slides across. And he sits there and talks to people in the living room or down to the kitchen, or indeed as people come in through the front door. I thought it was a brilliant idea, so I've, I've used it in my own house, as you'll see in a minute. <laughs> Anyhow, they began to start throwing the children out, and um, a bit like here, actually, I imagine. And um, so we built a smaller version next door, and it became known in the village as the Madonna and Child Project, which I thought was quite sweet. So there it is. And the whole point is it's part of that dry stone wall landscape. I always hope one day it'd be quite nice to do a sort of collection of ten houses. It would be quite an interesting thing to do. Now, that's one of my hobbies. That's me. I fly a microlite, registration Golf Romeo India Bravo Alpha, which is G, which all British planes are called G, and RIBA. So I've got the presidential plane. And um, uh, we had a client on a very high airstrip in a place called Straven, south of Glasgow. And it's a real blasted heath uh, landscape. There's nothing there, really, uh, except some hangars and some old World War II bits and pieces corrugated and what have you, and the client wanted to live on the, on the site. We didn't want a garden. They wanted to live on the first floor and have some little bedrooms on the ground floor for wandering aviators. So it was a very interesting project. What do you do? And now I have to, I have to make a little confession here. There is a certain Australian influence in this. Um, uh, uh, you'll see in a minute. So there's the ground floor with the little bedrooms and what have you. And it's a very rational steel frame. You can see that. And then, of course, the first floor cantilevers out. Um, to make much more space on the first floor. And then there's the section with a little um, study up in the roof for his and hers study. And that's basically it. So this is what it looks like. See what I mean? I, I did apologize. It has a certain sort of, but it's about how you make it. I think that's the really important thing. And you know, obviously in that instance, it was about sort of elements of walls made out of corrugated aluminum, which then sort of lap over each other as a deliberate sort of formal idea. It's kind of strange for me to do this house because I'm always doing courtyards or houses screened in little spaces and whatnot. So this was very sort of agrophobic sort of experience, actually. Uh, this has been on, actually, this has been on Australian TV, actually. This has been on uh, the dreadful Grand Designs program, not my idea. But if you ever notice that program, the architect gets about 45 seconds out of an hour, which is a bit annoying. Anyway, so there's the architect on a site visit. Uh, and uh, so there we go. And then the final house didn't happen, but it's an interesting project because, again, coming back to this idea of place, architecture of its place, this is an 18th century lodge house, and this was a very beautiful road which goes down a hill, these are the contours, into a forest, and through the forest you see the most amazing views of the Tweed Valley, and through the forest here, and down this hill here, and then you pop out at the end, and there's this absolutely beautiful bridge, and then there's a minor country house here. That's the absolute classic sort of picturesque approach to how you get to a country house. Well, after the war, it was all chopped up. The, 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 there was a boundary put here, and people made a new entrance to the country house. And this was forested with conifers, so it's all rather sad. And the client owned the site. The trees came down. And legally, you have two years before you're obliged to plant them again to come up with a change of use. So, in Scotland and England, we also have this very severe rule about no individual houses in the countryside. 
so that we don't become like Ireland, really. Um, and it's quite, quite depressing, actually, quite often. But we tried to do a bargain with the devil, saying, if we actually restored this landscape, would they allow us to have a house? Which is, you can see where I'm coming. It's a very, um, it's a contradiction in terms, isn't it, really? Because if you're restoring a landscape, then what's a bloody house doing there? You know, it wasn't there. So, so we mystified us how to do it. And I thought it'd be interesting to do it as a sort of piece of archaeology, a sort of ambiguity. And my favorite um, piece of archaeology, certainly in Scotland, is this broch in, you know, do you know about brochs? It's the only Scottish building type that's unique to Scotland. And they're found all over the, mostly the western seaboard. But actually, there's one in the borders. This is the only one that's more or less intact. It's about 12 meters high on the island of Musa in the Shetland Islands. And it's got a double wall with, with spiral staircases go around. Absolutely wonderful thing. So it's just stunning. Anyhow, there's the remains of one not very far away uh, here. And so we thought that's quite interesting. So that is our plan. Uh, a, a little bit of planning chat here, of course. But although we've got fantastic views, we decided to make an internal courtyard house. It's quite a big house, as you can see. Uh, but occasionally, little views out from that courtyard, sort of frame views of the landscape. And then if you go upstairs, then there's a sort of Farnsworth pavilion where you're totally in the landscape to contrast. Uh, that would have been what you would see as you come down the road. And it's a sort of, you don't quite know what it is, really. Um, and then if you're in your microlight, that gives the game away. That's what it would see. And we went to Planning Appeal, which is a committee of five councillors and we lost it by three votes to two. The bastards. Anyhow, so that's the end of houses, apart from my own. Now, this is interesting. Um, does anyone know where this is? This is the best kept secret in the North Atlantic. This is the Faroe Islands, which I go to quite a lot. It's a Danish autonomous, um, I don't know, what do you call it, uh, land. And uh, it sits halfway between Scotland and Iceland. And you can fly direct from Edinburgh, but they're not terribly interested in tourism because they've got masses of fish. They're outside the EU and they're fabulously wealthy. They've got the most incredible infrastructure. They build incredible tunnels under the sea to link one island to another. And there's only 50,000 of them. They've got, a, they've got a, an amazing symphony orchestra. I went there for the eclipse and they've got almost virtually a, pro a professional symphony orchestra for 50,000 people. It's just, what? What is going on? It's an incredible place. So there it is. Yes, there's the Faroe Islands, there's Iceland, there's Scotland, so you now get to see where I am. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty spectacular place, actually, I have to say. I love going there, I've got lots of friends there. And, and it also has its architecture, as you would expect, which is rather sweet. And, um, well, we did a competition for a church on a, a sort of difficult site. I mean, that's the site on a very miserable day. And this is suburban Torshaven, and this is a stream, which is a little nature reserve, and the sea is somewhere over there in the mist. And we had to do a church, and I was, I've never done a church, and I, I was terrified, actually, because of all the baggage that churches bring with them, you know, and you don't know where to start. So I remember discovering a church by Alto in Italy at a place called Riola, which I've always thought was beautiful. So we kind of started a bit with that, we thought it was appropriate. So it sits here and um, there's the nature reserve and there's the sort of suburbia and so this is if you like the front and so there's the plan which you could probably spot has got a certain alto-esque quality to it i guess and there's sort of parish rooms here and that's the church there that's the section that's the elevation to the to the suburbia that's the elevation to the nature reserve so it's quite a janus like building and that's a campanile and that's what it would have looked like to the stream and what have you. There's the sea. And that's what it would have looked like to the suburbia, to the front. Uh, and that's the church um, inside. I thought it was rather good, actually. But we didn't win. And the one that did one was terribly boring. And then <laughs> they decided not to build anything. So bugger. Um, however, it's fun. I always tell students, you never throw an idea away. You store it away. Uh, it'll pop back up in about 20 years' time. Well, now into the city. These are buildings that have disappeared in the old town of Edinburgh, and I, I love looking at pictures of them. Edinburgh was actually a timber city um, quite a long time ago, but I just think it's, I mean, these buildings, no architect involved in that, I'm sure, but I just love the sort of informality, oh, sorry, the way the um, jetties come out, the staircases start on the front, 
And in particular, when you get to the top, you have an idea of roofed rooms where one roof contains a whole room and another room. And it's, it's just a wonderful way of composing a facade, really. It's completely bonkers, but it's just fantastic. And this is a bit of the old town which has been heavily restored, John Knox's house. I've never been in that there. I'd love to go in there, actually. Uh, I think it's amazing. So we had a site here to do social housing. So the interesting thing is most of that medieval stuff has disappeared. In fact, the irony is the old town is now newer than the new town, which is very ironic. So we thought it'd be interesting to talk about the medieval architecture that disappeared. So a slightly romantic scheme where we, the roofed rooms and the jetties and the staircase on the outside and the colonnade sits on the corner of the cannon gate like that. This was a bit of a quantity surveying miracle actually. Nine flats and a shop for a little housing association. But I think it's an interesting conversation back to the medieval architecture of the old town. And then further up the hill in the much denser part of Edinburgh, uh, we won a competition uh, here basically. And this is the famous Kipperbone plan of the new town with tiny little alleyways and one room thick buildings and it became incredibly insanitary and that's one of the reasons the new town happened and in the 19th century um, all this stuff was knocked down to try and get light in and uh, this site became a car park this is a, a mission to the to the um, homeless and vice and prostitution and you know that went on in this part of the world it's now our office so not much change there. Anyway, anyway so our, our office, our design is incredibly simple and it basically reinvents that close. So there's the car park as was and there's the building as is. It's, but it, I'm, it's completely locked into that idea of that map. I mean, it couldn't be anywhere else. It's totally of its place, but it's also at the same time, I think, completely contemporary. And it's also a nice piece of city because it has a cafe and it has offices as well as residences. So there it sits in this incredibly dense historic bit of the city and you walk down the hill you see tourists taking pictures of it which is quite amusing um, and then when you go down the restituted close you actually get to our office front door which is quite cunning. Now I lived in one of these for 18 years. These are special workers houses in Edinburgh called colony houses and they're extremely social. People sit out in their top deck here and they talk to their neighbours and everybody gets to know each other. Whereas the normal way of um, living in Scotland is tenement flats with an internal common stair. Now, com obviously, people don't sit out in their internal common stair, so they don't get to know each other. And so I'm interested in the idea of sociability. So that's the colony house arrangement. This guy's front is this guy's back. This guy's front is this guy's back. And there's roads on both sides. So it's kind of curious way. Of, but I lived there for 18 years, and I slightly fell in love with it. So we won a competition for a site here and this is again very locked into the history of Edinburgh because that was a village called Broughton Village. Here's the old town and this is the whole area here is where the new town is now. And if you look at the plan it says proposed street and they were going to wipe off uh, the village off the face of the earth. But what actually happened was far more interesting. The village got sort of surrounded in the backlands of the new town tenements. So I was described it must be a bit like being a farmer in Milton Keynes, one minute you're in countryside, the next minute you're in somebody's back garden. And that's, um, Milton Keynes is one of our more notorious new towns, but this is the plan of, the, that's the area of the competition. So we thought it'd be quite interesting to build on the footprint and to do the opposite of the new town, to make a secret informal village and to have external staircases. So that's what we did and that's where it sits. And it's now yuppie heaven and the flats exchange a lot of money and we give people little hints of how they can personalize it of course and it's a little informal village of people living in the backlands of the Edmund Newton. This is the back typically of a tenement of which all Scotland is virtually made. And then the next one is to combine that idea with a courtyard because this is a very heavily and very picturesque courtyard very close to Holyrood Palace, Whitehorse Close very heavily restored. And, but it seems to me there's a little narrow passageway which gets you into the courtyard. It's a wonderful way of urban living, as long as you don't mind being not too anonymous. So you have your own front door, up a staircase or whatever have you, and then a, what it is about eight flats share a courtyard together. And I think that's a really nice urban way of living. So we had a client in Glasgow, this is the east end of Glasgow, it looks like World War II finished 
last week. But this is actually the cleared meat market. And if you look very carefully, there's an arch there which is kept up. And there's another one just there. And we went in for this competition here. And we came second in it. So they gave us this building as a sort of consolation prize. And, uh, and this is the first phase. And then about 10 years later, we won a master plan here. So this is our building. And it is attached to this listed arch. It was the Meat Traders Hotel. And this is, again, coming back to the architecture of ruins, I suppose, and locking it in. This was an unsafe central section of the whole building. And if you look carefully, you can see the original entrance to the hotel. So we pushed it down, basically, and made it like that. So there's the entrance now, and there's the remains of those windows. But actually behind is a courtyard. You, you ring the bell here. So instead of having a common stair, you have a common courtyard with external stairs, which is quite an interesting um, take on the Scottish tenement, actually. And it's been a great social success. People have found park benches and all sorts of things have turned up in this courtyard. And they all get to know each other, which is very nice. And then, as I said, we won the competition next door for a master plan. And this is the, the restored arch here. So we decided to make a courtyard here around which various schemes would gravitate. So we had th three other architects to master plan. This is Eldon Cannon. That's their courtyard. This is Page and Park. That's their courtyard. This is uh, JM Architects. Did, they didn't actually get the idea very well. But, and then this is us, center stage. <laughs> Never mind. You can lead a horse to water, as they say. So, uh, so there you go through the arch, and there's our building straight ahead. And that's it. So you go through what is a kind of lich gate, and some of the, all the flats are approached externally. There's no internal accommodation. So there you go up, and then you go up, and then behind those red panels are two more staircases and all the flats have got something outside their front door. So guess what? It's become an incredibly friendly, neighborly, social place. And in fact, all the kids in the whole area come and play here because they can be supervised by people sitting out. But of course, it gives us four times the amount of work because everybody else had repetitive plans. And of course, we don't have repetitive plans, but for the same fee. So there you go. <coughs> so there you can see that scheme. Um, there's two people from my office posing. Um, but we did do some post occupancy surveys. And we asked about the external staircases. Did you mind walking up it in the rain, you know, expecting them so it's terrible? But no, they said, oh, we meet people on the way. And it, I, think, I think if you make a staircase which takes a horizontal journey as well as a vertical one, that, that actually makes for something really interesting. A repetitive dog leg staircase is almost by its nature incredibly boring. So there you go. And. And then we just took that idea to Belfast because they had exactly the same problem with postgraduate students in Belfast. I say you don't have to invent things. This is how they used to put up students in tower blocks in Belfast for Queen's University. Didn't work. They knocked them all down. And, and this is what they did, was a sort of housing estate on steroids, really, for the undergraduates. And this site was reserved for the postgraduates. We had to knock down these buildings. Had some big mature trees and some rather posh people lived here. So um, if you do student housing in Britain, it's designed generally by a fatal combination of the quantity surveyor and the fire, en fire engineer. It's not generally designed by architects. So here's, here's a room. There's eight rooms. There's a kitchen dining room. And then somebody puts them all together and pretends that you've got three flats, whereas in fact you've got a great big long artificially lighted corridor with lots of rooms off it which is kind of a bit like a prism, really, isn't it? And that's where you put students for three years and hope they don't go mad, really. And it's unbelievably depressing. So we, the, the planners were expecting something like that with all these trees around. But after the usual battle, we did that instead, which was to make a garden and to make a perimeter scheme. And you enter via a pend, an alleyway, and then there's a, f a rise on the site so this is the lowest end, and then that's the main floor. And um, the colors correspond to the different sizes of flats of so 4, 3, 2, 1. But the idea, again, is that the staircase is going to bounce into the section. And there's a very good reason, fire reason, for that. Because in Britain, you don't have to have any dedicated fire circulation on the ground floor on the first floor. You're expected to leap out of a window on the first floor. It's only on the second floor that you have to have a protected means of escape. So that means if by the time you've got, there's the first floor, by the time you've got to the second floor, you actually can have a very, very small circulation because you're entering in the plan. In other words, you don't have a long corridor to take you through the plan. 
So there's logic to this actually, to make an efficient building and then again uh, the top floor. So when we interviewed for this job it was quite funny because the cleaners in Queens clean the corridors and the staircases, right? And the students clean everything else. And we got stopped in the middle of the presentation and the estates officer said, no cleaners. I said, no, you won't need any cleaning. God will do the cleaning. And immediately I said that, I realized that was a really stupid thing to say in Northern Ireland, actually. And, um, but I said, yeah, you'll just need no cleaners. And he said, hmm, no cleaners. And that's how we got the job, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, you just get the job, don't you? And uh, thank God. But uh, so it was a fun job. And that's what it looks like. And it's a fantastically sociable place, massively oversubscribed. And everybody, all the kitchens and social spaces are on this side, and the bedrooms are on the quiet side on the other side. So you can people, see people coming up and down. You sit on balconies. You can lean out the kitchen. You can do all sorts of things. And it's so much more. It's a, it's a different world from that corridor, which is what student housing providers uh, give you. Now, you know, clients or universities or whoever it is don't say this, do they? It's architects who bring these ideas to the table. And that's why you need architects, it seems to me, is that we bring social ideas as well as physical ideas. So there it is. And then very quickly, we working for Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. This is where most of the posh colleges of Cambridge University. And we've got the wrong side of the tracks, the old poly, which is called Anglia Ruskin University. All these people are very snooty about it, of course. And we ended up designing a satellite campus here for them, which they had their nose put out of joint because we won the best building in Cambridge, which the university always wins every year. And this year, the little upstart Anglia Ruskin won it, so that was very amusing. It's an old primary school and some horrible um, derelict buildings here, but the point being is had, it's incredible, Cambridge is an even more difficult place to get planning permission than Edinburgh. I mean, there's loads of people who are trying to stop you doing what you're doing. And there's some nice little houses here, small scale houses, this was going to become a music therapy. This is a nursery school with all the problems that that has. This is a rather strange, large law court building. There's a road here called East Road, which is the main way you would access this site. There's industrial things here which cause a noise, and there's some housing here. So there's sort of different things. And so, you know, in Cambridge, it's interesting. I'm interested in chimneys because there's this wonderful lane, Trinity Lane, and this was Jesus College and its chimneys. And of course, nowadays, chimneys are really used for cooling rather than heating, I think. We won a competition which sadly faded away for Jesus College to make a naturally ventilated auditorium uh, using very thick um, um, masonry and um, uh, these glass tops and then using the lake as well to cool. So, um, but it, it sort of was interesting. So anyway, here we are, there's our plan and it's a nursing faculty and it goes over here and there's lecture theatres and things here and there's a little space here and there's there's deliberately quite tight little spaces which are just like Cambridge colleges where you, you compress the space and then come out of the space. So this is what it looks like. There's the little primary school restored. Um, there's our row of chimneys uh, because we couldn't have any opening windows here because of the noise. So they now deal with the ventilation. There's one of the pens in. There's another tight space. There's the entrance space there. So it's quite tight deliberately. And then that all opens onto one big space in the middle. So it's another it's not a spectacular piece of architecture, but I think it, it fits into the idea of what a Cambridge college is basically about. Um, it's, a, it's a place apart from the town with a sort of very defined threshold to get to it. So there you go. And that's in the nursing faculty, and, and then that's the lecture theatre. And then finally, we built it right up at this end to sort of talk to this horrible law court building here make a big statement at the very end. So there's a sort of change of scale all the way around the, the, the building. Now, Alan mentioned that we had built, we won a competition for a new British High Commission in Sri Lanka. That's the old one built at Independence. This is the new site. That's a man with a gun. And uh, we built it during various phases of the Sri Lankan Civil War. And obviously, security was a massive issue to do with explosives. It's quite good fun, actually. We, we had to go to a place in Cumberland and watch them blow up one of our windows. It cost a quarter of a million pounds just to blow up the window, and it failed. <laughs> it was great fun, though. 
when I went there, I was acutely aware of Geoffrey Barwell's work, who's a very, uh, sadly now dead, but <coughs> I might be following him, and um, there he sits in his office. Now, this is now a wonderful restaurant, and the first night I went there, uh, I had to go there, of course, to the restaurant. And I was looking at that picture in the book and thinking, you can't think of a nicer office, can you, as you've got natural materials reflecting light, you've got fans, with, you've got the sound of water here, you've got um, diffuse light and intense sunlight. I mean, you guys in Austra Australia get to do this too, the sort of ins inside, outside, in the way that we don't. Uh, so we decided to make a single story courtyard building, which is quite revolutionary actually because the heavies always want you to put the ambassador on the first floor. So we had a big argument with the security people. That's the final um, plan of the whole thing. And, and then you've got sort of standoff distances for bombing and things. The Americans have got a standard embassy, which they sort of just parachute in regardless. Sort of Fort Knox, um, quite interesting. No interest in the local culture at all. And so there is the, um, there's a sort of typing pool here and then different, different departments in the wings. And this is where the ambassador is and what have you. And you come in here and if you, there's a sort of port cochere here. This is obviously the gatehouse and there's a bit of parking here. And then there's a club with a swimming pool and tennis court and things there. And at this end is a visa application. And then you also go through there uh, to the consulate here. So if you, you lose your passport or your husband or something, then that's where you go. There's a tea and sympathy room, which I quite like. Anyhow, half the year you could switch off the air. The air conditioning is there. You could switch off the air conditioning and have natural ventilation. So we had this big thermal chimney which expels air at the top and a flap here which is opened and then you open the doors and the air flows right through the building and it kind of works actually and that became if you like the motif of the entire building they turn into lanterns at the end there's a, a window here that you can see in that's the consular uh, and visa entrance you're not going to believe it actually I mean talk about fate they changed the system of issuing visas so it's no longer need to do it in person. So they then had a lot of building empty. So you never guess what they did. This was about three years ago. They've rented it to the European Union. <laughs> so now we've got a building with Brexit, of course, and the European Union is one end of the British Embassy. I think it's hilarious, actually. But anyway. <laughs> so there's the view in. I'll just whiz through these because it's a sort of photogenic building just to get the idea. There's lots of water everywhere and uh, local materials of granite and coconut. Uh, that's the main entrance. These girls get around, as you can see. That's the sort of port cochere. <coughs> that's the, um, the uh, stepping stone to the ambassador's residence. <coughs> Dear me, sorry about that. Uh, um, the ambassador lives next door. It's night time, fish, waterfalls, sound of water, which I think is really interesting. That's something I picked up from Scarpa. That's a party terrace where there's a waterfall just off the site here. There's another watery courtyard. There's another one, and that's, those are the flaps up there. And this guy is working in the garden. There he is. So that came from that photograph <coughs> of Geoffrey Barwa. So I suppose it's quite interesting that we I mean, obviously it's sensitive for the former colonial power, what they build there, and I think it's quite interesting that we sort of learnt from Sri Lanka's best architect. I think that's the best thing you could do, really. There's the ambassador's office, and the only way we got that through the security is to completely flood the courtyard, so you have to be real James Bond to swim in before you get into there. There's the Queen, the ambassador, the typing pool, details, water, water, coconut, gargoyles, swimming pool. <coughs> There's a bit of Barragon has wandered in there. I don't know what he's doing there, but who cares? Architect having a swim. Uh, and then kids love that window. So that was fun, actually, to suddenly find ourselves in a totally different culture. Now, I thought, I'm going to go quite quickly now, because I don't want you to be sitting here all night. Some arts buildings. We think the most important thing in an arts building is the cafe, because you've got to get people to cross the threshold. And this is a church in Peebles in the borders and there's a competition and everybody put little glass boxes on the front of course but this was a road to the town car park this is the main street so we decided to make this a schizophrenic building by closing these doors 
and taking away the side wall and making that the theatre. So it looks like a church from this side and a theatre from that side. Slightly strange thing. There you go. That's the plan with a terrace that steals some of the road. Up, upper plan section. It's a very tightly fitted building. This. So there's the new elevation and that is now, that is now obviously a theatre. And I think that's terribly important because, I mean, what to do with disused churches, I don't know about Australia, but it's a very common problem. And most people just put a sign up saying, you know, fitness centre or climbing wall or whatever, you know. And I think it, you need to do more than that. You need to tell people what's going on. So it's become a social centre too, which is incredibly important. And then a much bigger project in Dundee, which is an old coal warehouse and a garage on a narrow site here, that's become an art centre. And what is an art centre? It must be something that's more than the sum of its parts, it seems to me. So there are two galleries, two cinemas, a printmaker's workshop and university facilities. But we made them all around a big cafe bar so people sort of meet each other in the sort of town square of the building. So those are the two main plans where you come in and go down to the cafe bar and from there you go to printmakers or into the cinemas. Or if you stay on that level, you go into the galleries. So, and this is all the ancillary stuff you need. So that's very, very basic. And that's the section. And that's the front, where there's a shop pushed onto the, onto the street. This is quite narrow frontage, so we made a big piazza to push the entrance as far back as possible. And then you come in here and go down to the cafe, and uh, that's what it looks like at night. And again, it's this formalised ruin, as you'll see in a minute. Back to this guy again. Here we are. Uh, there we are. So it's again that lining of a ruin and the formalisation of the ruin there. And then that green architecture carries around on the other, other wing as a totally new piece of architecture. So it's quite an interesting thing to do. And then this space in the corner becomes a good outside space. There's the galleries, there's a cinema, it's got a window, which is very unusual. So that's, that's uh, Dundee, very quickly. And now um, a project which makes me cry, actually, because if there's one project I wanted, it's this one, but the bastards gave it to Chipperfield. Instantly, we beat Chipperfield at Dundee, so it's now one all. I don't hold it against him, but I do hold it against the jury. This is the famous Newtown plan, with originally there was going to be a church here and a church here. This is George Street, but the provost nipped in and built his house there, so the church ended up there. It was a wonderful piece of chicanery. And there's a space at the back, and people have been looking for a site for a 1,000-seat concert hall. And so this house became the Royal Bank of Scotland headquarters, and there was a big domed, there's the building on St Andrew's Square and this is the, I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of the dome but there is this amazing domed banking hall and our idea was to take that away and go on into the um, uh, concert hall. So we gave them that idea about five years ago and it took five years to percolate through the Edinburgh establishment and came out as a competition. That was just a sort of sketch really. And so I said you know 1774 and then a much bigger thing in 1857, and a much bigger thing in 2020. You know, that's the continuity of history idea again. So we looked at also, there was a massive impenetrable block. And so a concert hall like that needs to be a social place. So we looked at ways of penetrating that block with pedestrian routes to make sure it was going to be a busy place. And this is Dundee, which is incredibly uh, busy uh, art centre. The most um, successful art centre in Scotland, if not Britain, actually. And we looked at, and you don't start with a blank sheet of paper, in my opinion. You look at concert halls, and we looked at the, my other thing, by the way, I sing with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra, so I've seen quite a lot of concert halls in my time. So this is one we're very familiar with, the City Hall, Glasgow, the Queen's Hall, Edinburgh, which is too small, um, and then the Sharoon, Kama Music Halle, wouldn't fit on the site, as you can see. Um, and then we looked at concert halls by the acoustician, Toyota, who'd already been appointed, and most of his uh, wouldn't fit on the site either. And then suddenly we found one that kind of would, which was the Marinsky Concert Hall, and it's actually a bit too big, so we chopped it off a bit. And that's how we designed our, our auditorium. But what it was really all about was trying to do two things, which was trying to get intimacy, so the back of the auditorium is never more than 10.9 metres from the conductor, and also to make sure that everybody can see uh, every bit of the orchestra. And this is a photograph of an amazing anatomical theatre in Padua, if you've ever been there. It's just a knockout, actually. And I've often wondered in concert halls why we don't use the sides as vertiginous places to look down. So we've done that in our um, auditorium, as you can see there. 
So I won't bore you with these drawings, I'll go fast. So if you follow the little red dot, you can see various views of the orchestra from the stalls, from the back of the stalls, center, back of the stalls, the other side of the stalls, uh, oh, we're at the, behind the orchestra here, from the side, and at the front, at the, from the side. That was a really interesting exercise. I really enjoyed it, actually. Uh, and from the, the rear of the gallery at the back. And that was our little uh, plan of it. And we were interested in the idea of introducing light. And there is basically the idea. So you come in, you come in through the hall, and then you go up a fantastic staircase which visits the auditoria, because there was a smaller one as well. And you get to the top, and you're turned, and there's a garden, and you're allowed to look at the whole of the Edinburgh Newtown. So there is our drawing of that. You can see the starry sky of the dome. And, and then I like roof gardens, and that's Jim Sterling's in, a, in London. And this is the view you would get, and you could see the castle and all sorts of stuff from the top. And the front <coughs> foyer was full of fountains. And that's the money shot of what you would see as you, uh, as you go from um, 1857 to 2000 and, uh, 17, or not. I'm very interested to see what Chippy comes up with. Now, I'm almost there. Um, this is a revelation to me. Dunfermline is a place, has anyone ever been to Dunfermline? No. Oh, one person has, great. I, I seem doomed to do interesting buildings in places that nobody goes to, actually. Uh, but uh, I'd never been there until, and it's just across the water from Edinburgh, and uh, it's got this amazing abbey. Uh, it's got half an abbey, I should say, because the main bit, this bit here, fell down and a 19th century parish church was built. But this is built by the same people who built Durham Cathedral. How can you tell? There's Durham Cathedral. Sorry, there's the abbey and there's Durham Cathedral. Obviously bigger, but it's the same, more or less. So there we go. And the site is here, and it was a competition. This is a bank, and this is the original Carnegie Library. Andrew Carnegie, of course, came from Dunfermline and gave all his money away. There's the site, and it was a car park at the back. There's the bank, uh, sorry, the library, grade B listed, and the bank here is also grade B listed. Not a very interesting building. And then it was uh, extended in the, in the 1990s by the local authority architect and the sort of the way that people thought you should do things in those days, probably still do actually. But we won this competition on the basis of the idea of taking historic buildings and turning them into exhibits within the museum. And, uh, and those buildings are amazing. That's the town hall, which looks like it's from Prague. There's the abbey. There's the abbot's house, the medieval abbot's house. There's a picture postcard view of it in the wintertime. It's a wonderful little building. And there's the, um, the abbey and the 19th century parish church. There's our site, a car park at the back. But there was another car park which we didn't own, which belonged to a trust which ran this building. And the big problem was, there's it looking over the graveyard, there's some sort of scraggy trees. You can't get in. This is the boundary of the site. You don't want to come in here because that's not very nice. And you can't get in because these are listed buildings. <coughs> and we owned to there. This is not our land. So it was a real problem for all the competitors. So I was quite interested actually. So I'll show you, this is what Make did. They half demolished the bank, which is very dangerous. This is what Page and Park did. They completely demolished the bank, even more dangerous. This is what Rearcon Hall did, ditto, completely demolished the bank. But what Murph did was much more interesting. Uh, we hinged the facade. So there it is. Obviously, we talked to Arabs about it. And basically, you get the listed building back at night. And then in the morning, it opens up. And uh, <laughs> councillors got very excited about this. One guy said this would be the equivalent for Dunfermline of changing of the guard. People would come and see the big door open in the morning, which is quite sweet. But the one Muppet from Historic Scotland managed to torpedo the whole idea, which eventually the project wobbled big time. And basically, the council then bought the car park from the trust. So we were able to come in from a garden we made. These are the competition drawings. And it was organized about a street with an architectural promenade which takes you to all the facilities and that sort of zigzags across the street. And that was the facade to the graveyard, which is quite radical. That's the internal street drawing. And then this is a sort of piece of nonsense because this is an enormous pivoting gate and it's our little sort of memory of our idea of the pivoting door, a little architect joke, really. Um, so I just like to tell you that. 
So here's the new plan. There's the garden. And basically the plan is, if you take the grid lines, this is um, servant space, serve space, servant space, circulation space, servant space, serve space. So you get that idea of how the building is ordered. And you come in here through this little courtyard. And then you come here. And this deals with everything, including the library now. So it's a big extension to the library. So there it is. You come in. And then you go up, and there's a cafe with a balcony here. And then here is a reference room, which is based on Alto's famous half-section um, uh, libraries. And you carry on up, and you get to a two-story museum or art galleries. One, two, three. These are toplets and can combine into one. And then two rooms in the original building are now plugged into the new circulation system, that and that. So that's also part of that deal. There's the internal section elevation. I won't bore you with this. There's the galleries. There's the um, top of the reference room. There is the museum, two-story high spaces within there. Now, this is interesting. Uh, you know, um, people spend the money where they want to. So that is a um, ashlar stone and then rubble where you can't see it. So how do you join new with old? So we basically took all the rubble away and slipped Corten in behind the ashlar like this. So there's it all going away. And there is the elevation. And there's it all happening. And there's it's happening during uh, construction. And there it is now. So that's quite an interesting conversation about new meeting old. We use Corten because it was a lot of industrial Dunfermline was part of the museum. And uh, that window there is a window to a secondary staircase. And that's aligned with the parish church as you come down the staircase. And then it's concrete with a steel superstructure, like that, like that, like that. And then the elevation is a stone facade, which is then kind of eroded to show you those servant spaces of windows and balconies, and um, a window here, and then the balcony to the cafe, and the kids' library down here. I forgot to mention that. Um, so you come in, there's the entrance desk. I'll just whiz through this. That's the old reference room. This is now the new one on the sort of half level idea of those Alto libraries, <coughs> like that. And that gets a spectacular view of the graveyard. That's the cafe. That's the view of the abbey from the cafe terrace. And then the, the medieval garden of Abbott's house is just simply carried on, so people won't realize they're in two different ownerships. And uh, so this is also a sort of medieval garden we made. The street is the most photogenic bit, so forgive me if I show you a few photos of lights in the street. And you do get fantastic, or well, I say so myself, um, views of near and far around Dunfermline. I think people in Dunfermline have really enjoyed that and stood there looking out at the distant landscape. That's right across the Firth of Forth to the Pentland Hills on the other side. Um, so there it sits. This building actually won the Best Building in Scotland Award um, last week. It's the first time we've won an award which has got a check, actually, <laughs> which is great. So we're all going to Lisbon in January. There's the galleries. There is the big window to the library. And then this becomes a hen-run window to the uh, side-lit gallery, which is there. And you can, by sliding screens away, you can have the whole elevation being the abbey. And in the other direction here, you can see uh, the new bridge and the Firth of Forth. And that's the entrance. And the museum is supposed to be made out of oak, like a kind of casket. And you go into it there, there's a loom, there's double height spaces, and there's no particular way of wandering around the museum. You find your own way. There's a couple of internal staircases. And then you find windows, which then give you, going right back to those competition drawings, buildings as exhibit. As this guy is part of the inside, but he's in the garden. There he is, looking back. And there's the internal staircase in the museum. And this window, which you may recognize from the um, Posanio uh, Canova extension by Scarpa, has gone on his holidays and has found himself in Dunfermline, sort of, as the culmination of the journey. And you come along the side into that window, and then you go and look at the whole panorama of Dunfermline and Abbey and the distant landscape from that window. And that's the sort of culmination of the whole journey up there. And I, I'm amazed, actually, we got planning permission, actually. I mean, it's quite a sensitive conservation area. But I think a competition always helps. The planners take their foot off the brake pedal if you've won a competition. Now, this is the penultimate, quickly. 
Piero del Francesco ideal city. Obviously, we see that as a, an assembly building of some sort, I guess. And this is about theatres. Now, Claudio's Olympic Theatre here is a building inside a building. And you know when you come in here, this is the back of the auditorium, obviously. And Alto, in an early project to the Uvascular, he cheated. He had pretty well straight seats. But he also did that so that when you're in the foyer, you knew that that was the theatre, although it isn't, it isn't a curved one like Palladio. We did the same idea in St Andrews with a project we didn't win in competition like that. But we did win with the same idea in Carnarvon where we made this object in the foyer. And here we are in Galway again. University of Galway had some old shit, <laughs> excuse me, um, which they didn't really look after very much as you can see. Some nice things on the inside but it was the marine biology department hanging out there. We gradually shooed them out. And this is the project with an entrance here, an entrance here, and again, that device of telling people where the auditorium is, which is also a kind of nice way of pe taking people around the corner. And these are sort of studio, it's a music and drama teaching department. And this one, the Ireland's Best Building Award. So at the moment, for the next two weeks, we have the Triple Crown. We, we hold UK House of the Year, Ireland's best building and Scotland's best building, which is not bad for an office of 12 people, actually. So there's our view of it. And of course, the main problem is the auditorium goes up to the roof. And how do you do with that? Well, of course, there's a mirror in here, of course, and that works brilliantly. So there is some very quick snaps. I don't have proper photographs of how we worked with that building, building inside a building again. And uh, there it is. Now, the bit you've all been waiting for, my house. <laughs> We're back in the Edmund Newtown. There's the village of Broughton again, and this is Broughton Street. That's the site. And Broughton Street was incorporated into the plan of the old town. There it is. It's the only pre-Newtown road that is. And there's the site. That's actually a monastery, which my neighbor lives in there. Um, and there's the site. And what happened was, this is a division between two estates, and they didn't really talk to each other very much. So this all comes crashing to a halt here, and nothing lines up. So in other words, it's the antithesis of the orderly new town. What should happen here, it should carry on and go around the corner like it does there and ditto here, but it doesn't. So that was great for me, excuse me, because I was able to tell the clients that this is a unique situation and we were not setting a precedent because precedent is something they hate. So there were four gables which shouldn't be there. And in the 1960s, they put a horrible mansard roof on because it was all a hotel in those days. So you've now got a bodged gable which shouldn't be there and it should be like that. So um, we tried to suggest that we should build high to hide all this. And of course, this is the other problem with planners. They love to use the word subservient. You should always be subservient. Why? I mean, Christopher Wren wasn't exactly subservient in Greenwich, was he? I mean, you know, I mean, nobody has been subservient in the past. It's a stupid idea. So I talked about the idea of making a building which um, brought this whole series of terraces to a halt for the first time instead of it just petering out. So there's an architectural language that goes across between the new, the smooth asher, the um, um, cornice, which then becomes a bookend. And that's the elevation. So that's how that works. And then <coughs> the shape of the building, which is unusual, is to do with the rise of light for this guy. Uh, so I'm trying to get as much in here as possible. But it's also to do with facing south and and using as much sunlight as possible and capturing that and recycling it. And this is the final section. It's on a hill, so there's a sort of fault line down the building here. This is a bedroom. This is a study deck here. This is the entrance to another bedroom. This is the living room. That's the dining room. That's the kitchen. And that's the master bedroom. And that's a terrace. And that's a garage. So the whole thing sits on a site by 11 by 6 meters. So it's, it's quite tight, actually. And there it sits today. That's the ground floor plan, which is in the basement, more or less. It's a thick-walled building, which is kind of interesting because that's the entrance. Because you might think to get more space, you should sort of do a glass box. But I mean, here you are in the living room. You've got these thick walls and these spaces and bedrooms and seats and things and the kitchen itself. And I think actually the space feels bigger because it has got other spaces um, ancillary to it. And then the master bedroom at the top. So here's how it looks. Um, like that, so it talks to the planners recommended refusal and I went and chatted up a councillor and to my utter astonishment we got planning commission, so there you go, <laughs> there is a god. 
Well, I wanted a disappearing corner, of course, like the Schroeder house, but there wasn't a location for it, so instead I did a disappearing stone panel. So there it is, a stone panel, which opens in the bedroom. And those of you who've seen the movie will know that that actually gives rise to a bath, uh, which is quite amusing. So here we are coming in. This is Venetian plasterwork against Duco Lucido. This is my Sonian wall, because this you see through, this you see through, some of these things you see through, but most of them are mirrors, so there's a trick. And if you go to the Sony Museum, it's exactly the same thing. You never quite tell what's a mirror. And then you go up the staircase, and, um, and then there's another gigantic mirror here. So about one in 10 people walk into it, actually, which is quite funny. And, uh, but if you can disguise the edges of mirrors, and if you can not see yourself, then the eye has no sense that it's a mirror. It can't, it can't work it out. So then there's a play with Ashla. We put little tiny windows in the Asher, which are in the bookcase behind, and as it were, play with coinstones. So there's a constant conversation to the architecture of the new town. There's the bookcase, and there's the coinstones, as it were. There's the main space. I like a kitchen which sits above the living room, then you can't see the mess. You know, most modern houses, I noticed here is quite clever actually, that you can't see the mess of making food, but you can talk to people, I think, across the top of the cabinet, which is another way of doing it. And then uh, that's looking out at the street, and then that's looking in the other direction. And then there are um, bits of in the wall where you get beams of light, so that's quite fun. I knew that was going to happen, but it's quite fun when it actually finally did. Uh, it took a very long time to design this house, in case you were wondering. So there's a sort of ingle nook where the, stair where the fire goes underneath the kitchen, basically, so that's a way of stealing space. And then this is a wall of timber, which then comes down and is a ceiling, so that is my um, bird's nest to cave idea and also it does make a huge difference to the heating bill as well um, and the same thing happens uh, in the bedroom upstairs there it is um, and this is the bedroom with the uh, panel down and that's it with the panel up this is the corner with the disappearing corner stone panels there it is open and you can see there's a secret bath the panels so you can actually have a sort of al fresco bath there which all my neighbors think is very amusing this is a homage, it's not a copy, it's a homage to the Carini Stampalia in Venice and I tracked down the guy who made the tiles uh, and we, all the water comes along the top of the wall um, here from the roof and comes down these waterfalls, goes along a watercourse, down another waterfall, through a pond with fish in it and then down to the basement where it gets used for the loos. So there are the tiles, which I now understand why Scarpa used because they have a life of their own, they just spring off the wall with light. It's, there's the ones in Venice. And there we are. And I think that is the last slide. Yes. So I hope you've not got too bored or tired or stiff. But there's a sort of thread, I hope you agree, that goes through all these projects. Well, I think there is anyway. You may think it's a piece of architectural nonsense, but I genuinely think it is uh, a thread. So. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs>